how to prevent or reverse hair from going gray. This is a clip from a live Q&A session open to CMJ Masterpass members. In addition to this episode, you can access lots of other free samples from these sessions at the first link in the description. The winner comes uh, the winner of the question submission contest comes from Christina Kang. And her question is, how to slow graying of hairs and potentially reverse it? Well, if I knew the answer to that, I would probably have less gray hair. As you can see, I obviously don't know the answer to this. But I will go over the biology a bit, and I'll go over some of what I believe could be known about it. I'll say at the outset that my mother had her first gray hair at the age of 14, and I had my first gray hair at the age of 25. There's Everyone knows this, but there's obviously a social, psychosocial com, uh, stress component to graying of hair. But um, I do I do suspect that there's a genetic basis to the graying of hair shared by my mom and me. And I do wonder if my adventures in trying to solve energy metabolism issues that seem to have a genetic basis, starting with biotin, may lead me in the right direction on that. With that said. Let's let's go to what we know about the biology. So, hair uh, hair pigment production is regulated at the level of the brain um, and through the hypothalamic pituitary, especially thyroidal and gonadal axes, as a result of a collection of neuropeptides, which in- include all of the hypothalamic neuropeptides that regulate the pituitary hormones, but also include some others, such as alpha-melanocyte-stimulating hormone. This collection is central in regulating, positively regulating the production of hair pigment. There are other factors, such as growth factors, inflammatory mediators, circadian rhythm mediators, that have been implicated. And there is some evidence that autophagic flux, meaning cycling in and out of autophagy to destroy senescent cells and poorly working things to be replaced with fresh things is all important. Now, if you just look at some of the nutrients involved in the neuropeptide production, All of the neuropeptides involved in hair production are activated in a process that depends on vitamin C, copper, zinc, and glycine. Then when you get to some of their downstream effects, you have, for example, thyroid hormone production is dependent on iodine, selenium, nourishment with sufficient calories, adequate body fat, and the right macronutrient balance. I would argue that that macronutrient balance would be favoring adequate protein and sufficient carbohydrate to convince the body that energy is abundant, which I think is likely to very much depend on the individual. I don't think everyone needs to eat the same amount of carbohydrate, but I do think there's a very clear relationship where carbohydrate has a positive signaling role in thyroid hormone production. Because carbohydrate is important as a versatile energy source, being able to play roles in energy metabolism that fat is not able to play. And so I I do believe that there's a positive role for insulin and leptin and the insulin to glucagon ratio, all of which are influenced by adequate body fat as a long-term storage of energy and adequate carbohydrate as a signal of short-term storage of energy that are quote unquote convincing the hypothalamic pituitary effector axes, all three of them, thyroidal, gonadal, and adrenal, that you are in a state of energy abundance. And then this feeds forward into the ability of the hormones to regulate your metabolism in a way that leads to robust energy metabolism and a robust support for the antioxidant system 
by energy metabolism. And if you're looking at thyroid hormone just alone, you're looking at iodine and selenium and then all of that, right? Because producing thyroid hormone is an incredibly oxidative. Actually, this is true of both thyroid hormone and melanin pigment. Both of these processes are extremely oxidative in nature and therefore depend on broad-based antioxidant protection. And then as a result of that, rely deeply on the, the entire system of energy metabolism because if you look at something, I, I think the the sort of enzymatic reaction that encapsulates the dependence of the antioxidant system on the system of energy metabolism is the glutathione reductase enzyme, where it is a riboflavin-dependent enzyme that is using energy carried by niacin in the form of NADPH from the system of energy metabolism to power and fuel the entire antioxidant system. So I, I think when you're looking at, some, and now if you look at what's, the, honestly, I think if you, I, I'll post in the show notes a pretty recent review on the biology of hair loss. And I think everyone wants to know exactly what's going on differently between an individual hair that's graying and one that's not. and people that go gray prematurely and those who don't people who you know go gray eventually and those who don't and there's a lot of research that is suggestive but there really is no smoking gun but i think two of the compelling lines of evidence about what is happening is you have a general reduction in the neuroendocrine axes that i was just talking about in the signaling to maintain hair pigment. And then you also have oxidative damage, which is to be expected because it's such an oxidative environment in the hair follicle in the way that producing thyroid hormone is such a dangerously oxidative, requires such a danger, dangerously oxidative environment. So when I look at this, you know, I think, well, Probably people can come up with drugs that support, you know, certain growth axes or something like that, um, stem cell treatments and whatever. But looking at it from a, a root cause perspective, I think it's it's very complex. It is not. It's. I think the the disease, the sort of binary diagnosis a disease or not diagnose a disease, pick a treatment for it, model in medicine, I think has limitations even for diseases because even when you have something very specific going on, you still have your antioxidant system and your energy metabolism system running in the background where you know if you have a 10% a, a decrement in energy metabolism beneath what's ideal, it's going to make it that much harder to heal from any disease. But I think with with hair graying, I don't think you have a disease. I think it's a it's a general um I think I think hair, it's hair is a form of is hair is a form of peacocking, right? So the the peacock has <laughs> has elaborate um artistically elaborate feathers to show its mate that it has, you know, energy that it can burn. Um, socially, humans peacock by buying a car that other people can't afford or using a status symbol in some way that they can show that they have money to burn. But biologically, hair is peacocking in very much the same way. And it is a it's a general manifestation of the body not being able to meet all of its priorities, I think. And I, I think, you know, some uh some ways to look at that is just that risk factors for uh if you look at risk factors for, for premature graying, um you'll see associations with obesity, high blood pressure, um dyslipidemia and diseasing of disease of aging as well 
Oh, here's what I want to say. Um, so premature graying is is uh, gray hair is an age independent predictor of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and cardiovascular disease. And so I, I think that that all indicates that you're not going to find a a specific sort of this is the cause of gray hair that you are going to be able to then find this is the treatment. And I would not expect general treatments to work for everyone because X solves gray hair. What I, what I would expect from this type of causality is that you need to find the weakest link in your antioxidant protection or your energy metabolism in terms of the actual production of energy, right? So when we're looking at energy metabolism, we're looking at all of the B vitamins, we're looking at iron, copper, sulfur, magnesium, potassium, et cetera. And, you know, that's the mechanical, what you need to produce energy. But then there's also the signaling that I was talking about before, right? So the feed forward of adequate body fat and the right macronutrient mix to signal to your body that you have what you need to be able to uh, burn energy in a confident, abundant manner, right? You, you need, in other words, the biochemical signals that you're in a state of abundance rather than scarcity. I think you need to look at, you know, those three areas, right? Antioxidant, um, antioxidant support, energy metabolism support on a fundamental mechanical being able to produce energy level and then also on the feed forward of the signaling that you have adequate energy that feeds into the neuroendocrine regulation of hair pigmentation now i think that's i think that perspective is supported by how awful the treatment literature is so i have this systematic review in front of me from 2020 so it's not that old it's called prema- uh, I'll link in the sh- show notes. It's called Premature Graying of Hair, Risk Factors, Comorbid Conditions, Pharmacotherapy, and Reversal, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And um, <laughs> they look at you know vitamin and mineral deficiencies, thyroid, hormone, drugs, et cetera. But it's, and there's so many, there's 36 studies in here, but you just read the description and it's... Um, And it's it's terrible, right? So section three point six point one, uh, P amino benzoic acid or PABA, which is of course part of the folate molecule and the BH four molecule. In a study of fifty patients with definite achrom- achromotrichia, thirty cases received only PABA, and the rest twenty cases received PABA. Was given in or English is also terrible in this paper. Um, thirty. 30 cases received PABA only and thir- and 20 cases received PABA in some combination with some endocrine products for concomitant release. It was observed that all the cases had darkening of hair a- after about two months. <laughs> the hell is that supposed to mean? So there was no control group um, and they, and they treated 50 people with a bunch of stuff and everyone, and everyone had darkening of hair, right? So like, when your systematic review needs to have a whole section that 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 is the is the um, content of the section, you know that the state of the literature is absolutely abominable. Uh, section three point six point two, calcium pantothenate, which is a, which is a salt of pantothenic acid, which is a precursor to vitamin B five. Uh, excuse me, which is a which is a form of vitamin B five and a pre- precursor to. 4-phosphopantothene and coenzyme A, which are incredibly important cofactors um, used in energy metabolism. So this is the section there. In a study of 19 patients, elderly men, as the age is not mentioned, seven received 100 milligrams calcium pantothenate and 200 milligrams PABA plus 50 grams of brewer's yeast daily. Five patients received yeast plus PABA and the other seven patients received yeast plus calcium pantothenate for eight months. Significant Recoloration was seen in two patients in the PABA plus calcium pantothenate plus Brewer's yeast arm. So, and that's that's the end of that study. So, two patients out of the 
seven that received that. What you know? What are we? What are we supposed to conclude from this? I mean, I think that some of this is random, right? But I also think that that's kind of what you would expect from the model that I would use to think about this, which is maybe two of the seven patients, their limiting factor for for energy metabolism was that they ran low in pantothenic acid and they needed more coenzyme A. Another study by Parisha et al. where two adolescent girls were given 200 milligrams calcium pantothenate orally, which led to the conversion which led to the conversion into black hairs. All right, so that's a, a, a case series of two girls. This study was followed by another one, which looked at 200 milligrams of calcium pentothenate in addition to gray hair evulsion in 39 girls. And after the last follow-up at three years, the mean change in total number of gray hairs from baseline was 43. I don't even find that description intelligible. Anyway, the the point is um, the point is that I I don't I don't think that we have I don't think we're ever going to come to the point where this is the treatment for gray hair unless it's of the nature of a pharmacological sort of force the differentiation of the of the melanocyte type of um type of approach you know or it's um or it's you know implants <laughs> um but i i think it i think it what we're going to get the i think the what's going to lead us to a solution on this is to look for what are the limiting factors in energy metabolism antioxidant support and the the neuroendocrine signaling of energy abundance and I think that's highly likely to be different for different people. I think the two factors, I think the, really the three factors that you're going to want to look at are, and by the way, this this explains the psychosocial stress component, right? Because the stress response through cortisol is opposing the abundance response through leptin and insulin, which spills forward into the hypothalamic, pituitary, thyroidal, and gonadal axes. Um, so, so anyway, you know, maybe your stress response or the stressors you have or however you're coping with them is the limiting factor among those. And it's the primary thing that's impacting the neuroendocrine signaling of energy abundance. Or maybe calcium pentothenate is what you needed because your deficiency, your your limiting factor was having sufficient CoA derived from pantothenic acid in the mechanical production of energy. Or it, you know, maybe it's calories for you, or it's body fat for you, or it's iodine for you, or it's go on down the list of all the factors that influence antioxidant protection, mechanic, the mechanics of energy production, and the neuroendocrine signaling of energy abundance. And I, I think that, I think it's, you know, lifestyle, nutrition, and also where I'm really focusing my energy now in my, in my own health adventure, I believe that there are not that many people who do not have some carrier status for one of the 1400 plus inborn errors of metabolism that is physiologically biochemically meaningful that to them as an influence on their metabolism and so if some i'm not sure what the number is third or half of those some hundreds of those are directly in the pathway of energy metabolism, then I, I suspect that that's going to create an enormous amount of diversity in what the limiting factor for any given person's energy metabolism is, because it may be that a lot of people, maybe a third of people or half of people or more than that, don't just need to look in chronometer and see what's deficient. 
but after everything's sufficient, might have some limiting factor in their energy metabolism where understanding the the key genetic bottleneck in their energy metabolism would unlock maybe one thing that they should supplement with. And that might be the most important thing for them to supplement with to reverse premature graying of hair, not because that thing is X and X reverses premature hair graying, but because that X factor for them was the limiting factor for their energy metabolism personally. And it is their energy metabolism personally. And the, and the brain's understanding that the energy metabolism is there and is there abundantly. That's the limiting factor for the, for the, body to confidently produce pigment as a signal of having plenty of energy to go around. So that's that's my answer on hair, hair graying. So thank you very much, Christina, for your question. I feel like that, you know, it, it, it wasn't a smoking gun sort of answer, but, but I think it was an honest answer and, and hopefully it was helpful. This is a clip from a live Q&A session open to CMJ Masterpass members. In addition to this episode, you can access lots of other free samples from these sessions at the first link in the description. If you want to become a Masterpass member so that you can participate in the next live Q&A, or so that you can have access to the complete recording and transcript of each Q&A session, you can join at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass. You can save 10% off the subscription price for as long as you remain a member by signing up at chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com slash Q&A. That's Q&A spelled out as Q-A-N-D-A. These links are in the description.